There's a light in the sky Rising in the air There's a feeling so strong It's time to light the fire Like a bright shining light Love Getting more out of life Love Sharing time Hello, welcome to the House of Wellness. I'm Luke Darcy and I'm thrilled, as always, to be joined by my great mate, Joe Stanley. Welcome, Joe. Darcy, it is always awesome to be here. I look forward to seeing you. It's a huge highlight compared to the only other three places that I go these days, which is home, the park and the supermarket. I almost feel guilty asking each other, what have you been up to, Joe? Because we know in Melbourne, not a lot. <laughs> Lockdown has been a pretty tough road to travel. But as we've said a lot in this show, innovation comes out of necessity. And we've seen some great ones, Joe. Recently caught up with the team here in Melbourne who have developed a wristband, like an Apple Watch, that beeps and vibrates on your arm to show you whether you're a metre and a half apart. Has a great ability. We hope to get some industries back up and running. So the innovation has been fantastic. I love that. I love the training dogs as COVID detectors. They were absolutely beautiful. A year ago, that wasn't on anyone's radar. And maybe there wouldn't even be a condition called crumpet feet if we all weren't forced to stay indoors wearing <laughs> up boots for way too long. And I really wish I'd never, ever heard the term yeah, crumpet feet. Do not Google it. We warned you last time. <laughs> well, to that end, there's a new type of therapy that's recently hit the headlines. We all know what it's like to shake with fear or with cold. But how about a treatment designed to shake off worries and fears? It's a new kind of vibration therapy called TRE. TRE. Apparently it works for animals and now experts in the field say this vibration therapy can help humans too. Dr David Bercelli is an international expert in trauma and conflict resolution. He spent two decades living and working in global hotspots, which helped him develop these revolutionary exercises. I started by asking him the obvious question, what is TRE? TRE is an acronym which stands for Tension and Trauma Releasing Exercises. And it's, it's very simple. It's a series of seven exercises that activates a tremor mechanism in the human body that helps reduce stress and tension. It does sound simple, but it also sounds like something I've never heard of before. How did you come up with this? Well, first of all, you think you never heard of it before, but I'm sure you've watched a dog shake in a thunderstorm. I assure you, you watch people when they were nervous standing in front of an audience, either their hand was shaking or their voice was quivering or their knees were shaking. We see this all the time. How I came up with it is a little bit more unusual because I was living in Africa in the Middle East and I was working with a nonprofit organization with um, survivors of war or political violence. So I was working and living within that environment. So there were lots of bombings and shootings and all this stuff that goes with living in war. And I was in a bomb shelter one time and I was holding two children. They were sitting on my laps because we were on a long bench and they were about two years old, but they were shivering like they were cold. And it was that shaking mechanism and I could feel it in my hands and I was fascinated. So I was looking around the bomb shelter and I saw that all the little children were shaking like this. Then when they got to be about nine, 10 or 11 years old, you could see that they were shaking, but they were trying to stop it. And the adults were not shaking at all. And right there, that moment, it's like, oh my goodness, we've learned how to inhibit or even stop a purely natural mechanism in our body that these young children haven't learned how to inhibit yet. So they give into it freely. So I began to recognize this tremor mechanism was automatic. It was natural to the human body. And when I came back to the United States, I began to explore and research this and discovered that mammals all do this. And, um, and so mammals do this in an uninhibited manner and mammals in the wild do not suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. It's very confronting to see for the first time. What actually makes the body shake? So we have central pattern generators that are located along the spinal column and they help our reflex responses. And then we've got muscle spindle fibers that are located right inside the muscles and they twitch we usually feel that very easy when the muscle is twitching. And then we have the brain stem and the cerebellum. They're the two most primitive parts of the brain. They are active 
in your breathing and your heart rate and your blood pressure, as an example. You don't think about those, but the, those parts of the brain continually activate those. Well, those parts of the brain are where the tremor mechanism comes from. It's a brainstem activation and it's very primitive. So what parts of the body are tremoring? I found out that it seems to be the abductor muscles, which are the muscles on the inner thigh of the legs. They seem to be able to activate easiest. And so when those abductor muscles activate, what they do is they're going to try to travel through the pelvis, okay? And they're going to go through what's called the psoas muscle, which connects the, the legs, the pelvis, and the lower back. Once it hits the spine, the, the lumbar spine, the lower back, it will try to travel its way up the spinal column, out the shoulders and arms, and into the neck. So literally, the tremors can go completely from your neck all the way down to your toes. Our body registers absolutely everything that has occurred to it. And most of us are living with traumas unresolved in our tissue. And by that, I mean our fascia and our muscle patterns. And we don't even know that they're still there. So what does the trembling in TRE do for that trauma? We know that vibration helps release tension. You vibrate at a certain frequency and it softens the muscle and tissue increases blood flow. When it softens that tissue, if that is connected to a registry of trauma in the brain, those two finally connect again. So the body and the brain through a neural pathways reconnect, the body actually releases the trauma, and as it releases trauma, it actually produces pleasure, meaning that tension that you didn't even know was there anymore is now gone, and you feel like, I can breathe better, or I can walk easier. I don't understand why, but the patterns that were embedded in the tissue are now gone. What are the kinds of trauma have you treated with TRA? I've worked with lots of military. I work with common people that have everyday traumas, such as growing up in a difficult childhood, as an example, or CEOs who are under severe stress, management teams, um, nonprofit organizations. But what I try to do is teach them how to help themselves as their own group to do this so that they're not coming to me as individuals, but they're coming as support teams so they work with each other to work as a team or as a family unit or as a community to heal their traumas together. So what would you say to someone who has never heard of TRE but they're very interested now? What can TRE give us? Okay, what it will do is give you an entrance way, your personal way to, do, to activate the tremor mechanism to then assess for yourself did that feel pleasurable? Did I like that? Even though that was a little bit odd, I had a good result from it. So I always tell people, I don't like to talk about the theory at all. What I want you to do is try it because then you become your own researcher. If it works for you, continue to use it. If it doesn't, drop it and move on in life. Well, whatever releases tension and stress is a good thing, Joe. Absolutely. So Taylor Swift got it right when she said, shake it off, <laughs> shake it off. <laughs> she did, you know I'm yes. right. She's right. Yes. Who knew so much wisdom could be found in a pop song? Well, 2020 <laughs> may be a year most of us are pretty keen to forget and move on from. However, 2020 vision is something that we are all very keen to have. Coming up, we take a look at eyesight, mine included. That's coming up next on The House of Wellness. Joe, they say the eyes are the windows to the soul, but if your vision is blurry or deteriorating, it can feel more like you're looking through a muddy car shield or a foggy window. 55% of Aussies have one or more long-term eye conditions, which can be things like long or short-sightedness, blurred vision, cataracts or macular degeneration. This is massively affected by age. If you're over 55, it jumps to around 93%. And lately, Joe. I've noticed occasionally, it's been slightly harder for me to read text, but I think you and the team yeah, at the we House of Wellness have been saying, <laughs> you seriously need to go and get your eyes checked. Maybe it was the print size, I'm not sure. <laughs> but uh, after many months of procrastinating, I finally went to Vision Australia for a checkup, and I'm looking forward to sharing the results with you a little bit later on. I look forward to that as well, <laughs> Daz. But here's our doctors, past and present, to clear up the facts on vision and eye health. 
Hi, and welcome to Medicine Past, Present and Future. My name's Dr. Nick, and I'm the past. And my name's Dr. Isabel, and I'm the future. And together, we're, we're the, the present. present. Now, Dr. Isabel, I've got a question for you today. OK. Which animal has eyes that are bigger than its brain? Eyes bigger than its brain? I have no idea, Dr. Nick. Is it a fish or something? No, it's the ostrich. Oh, OK. Well, I've got one for you then. How many moving parts are there in the human eye? Ooh, uh, seven. Oh, come on, over two million. Oh, that's an eye-opening piece of information, Dr. Isabel. And that's a terrible dad joke even from you, Dr. Nick. But it does lead us nicely to today's topic, which is everything vision and eye health. Now, we take being able to see for granted, but of course, it wasn't always so. Yes, the first glasses were made in Italy around about 1200 AD. That's just 800 years ago. Before that, if you couldn't see anything, it was just, well, bad luck. But Dr. Isabel, you may remember this, that my vision was perfect until I was in my late 40s. Then all of a sudden, the paper started looking a bit blurry in the morning. What was going on there? Ah, so this is what happens when you get older and the lens in your eye starts to stiffen, makes it harder to see things that are closer up. And if I remember correctly, Dr. Nick, you used to sit there at the breakfast table with the newspaper and you'd have it out here and you'd say, what does that bit say? Yeah, my arms were really not quite long enough. <laughs> and then I just popped down to the corner shop and bought a pair of magnifying glasses and everything seemed better. People would say to me, oh, you mustn't use those. They're bad for your eyes. Was that true? There's actually no truth in that at all. What's happening there, Dr Nick, is you're actually just getting older and your oh. vision's getting worse. But it does bring us to a really interesting topic of conversation, which is myths around eye health. So I've got one for you. We were told that eating carrots was good for our night vision. Is there any truth to that? Now, carrots do contain vitamin A, which the eye needs. But this story about night vision and carrots, it's fabulous. It comes from the Second World War because the British had developed a radar system that could detect the German bombers at night time. And so the British fighters were shooting down these German bombers, but they didn't want the Germans to know the technology. So they put out this story that they were feeding the British pilots carrots Ooh, to help their night vision. I mean, it's just lovely, isn't it? But then, Dr. Isabel, one of the things that parents are sometimes told is that if their kids sit too close to the TV or if they read at night time, that'll be bad for their eyes. Is that one true? So there's no truth in that at all, actually. But I'll tell you one thing that will really damage your eyes, Dr. Nick, and that's looking directly at the sunlight. It can really damage your eyes, so please don't do it. In fact, sunlight can contribute to a range of different conditions, things like cataracts and even cancer of the eyeball. So wearing dark glasses doesn't just look cool, but it's actually a really good thing for your eye health, whether you're an adult, a kid or even a baby, particularly on bright sunny days. Uh, but Dr. Isabel, I've got a confession to make. I usually wear glasses all the time. Dr. Nick, I also have a confession to make. So do I. <laughs> well, thank you, Dr. Isabel. And thank you, Dr. Nick. And nice to be able to see you clearly. <laughs> you too. <laughs> So that was Nick and Isabel Carr. They're busting the myths about eye health. Did you know that about carrots and night vision, Joe? I had no idea, and kids of the world will rejoice about their verdict on watching TV. Bring it on, they'll yeah, say. The kids will absolutely <laughs> love that one, Joe. No more carrots are required. Yeah, and hours of telly. <laughs> but eyes are fascinating the more you think about them. So, how about a few eye facts that might surprise you as much as the carrots myth does? <laughs> The average person blinks 12 times a minute. The muscles that move the eyes are the strongest muscles in the human body for the job they do. They're 100 times more powerful than they need to be. Our eyes are the same size at birth, but our nose and ears never stop growing. On a dark night, a human eye can see a candle flickering 45 kilometres away, which sounds a very long way away to me. And finally, the giant squid has the largest eye of all. Incredible facts, Joe. You've done your research <laughs> today. Now, you mentioned we blink about 12 times a minute, but women actually blink almost twice as much as men. Did you know that? I didn't. And when you talk about blinking, I find now I'm just doing it non-stop. It's really... <laughs> I'm very self-conscious of that. <laughs> that is funny, Joe. As soon as you start <laughs> mentioning blinking, we get very conscious about doing it. But hold that blink, because after the break, I put my eyeballs on the line with an eyesight test. That's next on The House of Wellness. As you well know, 
know, Joe, lately I've noticed that my vision might be not quite as perfect as I once thought, and World Sight Day got me thinking that perhaps it's time to go and do something about it. Well, You've no. been encouraging that too. Oh, well, I've just noticed <laughs> a little bit of a struggle here and there, but neither of us are in the real danger age bracket when it comes to our vision just yet, Darce. Eye issues generally start kicking in with the over 50s, but the good news is that 90% of vision impairment is preventable or treatable. Hey, all the same though, Joe, I took the plunge and got my eyes checked by Vision Australia. They're a fantastic organisation that uses the latest advancements in science and technology, so I was in very good hands. That's an F up there, Tony. <laughs> top, <laughs> top of the class? Or top not? of the class. We're got onto a good start. Got a good feeling for that. So I'm going to put the trial frames on your face. Okay. And we'll test the right eye first. This is a very old school way of doing an eye test, isn't it? Eh? Definitely. Right. So using troll frames and um, lenses. Yep. Just going to slot a tissue in just to make sure that you don't um, cheat. You heard about my reputation, then, eh? Tony. If you look at the chart straight ahead, yes. what's the lowest line you can read? So the black line is EZHPV. Yep. Below that, DPNF. So when I tested Luke's distance vision, I tested each eye separately first, and his distance vision for both eyes is um, better than 2020 vision, so he has good eyesight for distance. I'm 100% fine, Tony. 100% fine is, for distance. This is good news. We're just going to test your near vision. So, so I thought I was home and hose there, Tony. <laughs> so. <laughs> so I'll get you to hold on to this reading chart. Yep. Uh, top line, neither of my parents were born country people. Some scheme of my father's caused us... He was able to read the smallest print on that eye chart as well. And, yeah, he has pretty good near vision for someone in his 40s, which generally um, people in their 40s would need some sort of reading glasses to help read, but he doesn't at all. So his vision for distance and near is perfect. So for everyone in the house of wellness, this has been... A hoax, Tony. Holding my <laughs> eyes for fun. Yeah. <laughs> well, I feel vindicated because uh, I think I was sent down here uh, uh, under the pretense that um, I my eyes are struggling and that I was squinting at the camera. Maybe I've just been fatigued. I think reading your phone a lot, getting up early in the morning, I go up early and, uh, and do radio most mornings, so maybe I come in there a little bit fatigued. But look, I'm happy. At 45 years of age, uh, the eyes are obviously going OK, but not adverse in the future to, uh, to getting glasses when the time comes. Not that it's competitive, Joe, but that was better than 2020 vision you just saw. There. How can you be better than 2020? Well, there's a line that's 2020, and I was three lines below the 2020. Yeah. So I'm not saying that uh, there's something to be proud of, but I was pretty proud. OK, not everything <laughs> is a competition, but well done, you and your well, eyes. Thank you. <laughs> now, I have been squinting a bit more. I've been wondering about whether or not I needed glasses. Yeah. Not saying that that's something I'd be concerned about in the future, but no. nice to know the eyes are working well. It is. An eye check every now and then is a good thing to do, so well done, Doug. No, it's a very simple thing to do, and thanks to the team at Vision Australia, plus sunglasses as well. Joe, wearing sunnies, not just about the look and the fashion, they serve a pretty important purpose as well. Other key ways to protect your eyesight is to avoid smoking and have a healthy diet. And when it comes to eating well, there are no better experts to set you on the path to health and wellness than Gerald Quigley and Luke Hines. GQ, whether you're a short black, long black, almond latte, soy chai, instant or espresso kind of person, there's no doubt that people love starting their day with a coffee. Well, many of us do, and that includes me, Hansi, but you know, three in four Australians have at least one coffee every day. My favourite's actually a piccolo, but the most popular coffee in Australia is the humble latte. I like to start my day with a bullet coffee. That means powering it up with MCT oil and grass-fed butter. But it's interesting that the old latte is Australia's favourite because I'm doing a Lucified take on one today with this magic mushroom latte. Well, we know that coffee wakes us up and that because of the caffeine, Heinze, but what we've got to remember is that the caffeine goes into our bloodstream and in turn goes to our brain. Now, that helps our energy levels, helps our mood, it actually helps our brain function. Well, that explains a lot. Kind of like I can't talk to this crew until I've had my morning coffee. <laughs> they tell me that, Heinze, every time we meet. Hey, 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 be nice. Now, as much as I do love my morning coffee, I can also get energy from foods. I mean, some of my favourites are things like bananas, avocados, nut seeds, even potatoes, which is why I probably love potato cakes so much. And that's because, Heinze, they all contain B vitamins. Now, there are eight B group vitamins, and they all contribute to our overall health. But one important thing they do is help us convert food into glucose that in turn is turned into energy. 
and that is also important for healthy nervous system development. I'm feeling energised already. Any other tips for boosting our energy, GQ? That's easy, Heinze. We need to get better quality sleep. We need to stop smoking, go easy on the alcohol, stay hydrated and keep moving. But you can get short bursts of energy from particular supplements. I can't express so enough how much I appreciate your knowledge, GQ. That coffee, Heinze, has definitely gone to your head. I'm wide awake to your jibes. Cheers to that. The A to Z of Vitamins is brought to you by Go Healthy. For superior supplement, for healthy energy and vitality, try New Zealand's number one premium supplement. Now available in Australia. Welcome back. Last week, Joe, we talked about playing football in front of a packed MCG, which I have to say, one of the great privileges and most exciting things I've ever done. But for most people, it takes an enormous amount of courage to stand up on a stage or a stadium and speak in front of a huge crowd. Can you recall the moment we had to appear in front of an audience and had an attack of the nerves. Joe, you've been doing that for a long while. Well, I did stand-up comedy for about 20 years and there was not a moment before I went on stage where I wasn't so physically ill I thought I was going to vomit. See, that but... to me is the <laughs> ultimate courage, standing in front of a, a, a group of people and trying to be funny. That must have taken extraordinary... Well, not trying, Sorry, being... Sorry, actually being funny, <laughs> yes. Of course you were funny. <laughs> oh, that would make me more nervous than anything else. <laughs> Now, next week, the AFL Grand Final will light up Brisbane's Gabba for the first time ever outside of Victoria. We're going to have a Grand Final played in Queensland. It's going to be a huge game. We're expecting 30,000 to be allowed into the stadium and millions and millions more around the country are going to be watching. Your team, unfortunately, Joe, won't be playing in the Grand Final, neither will mine. No, that's OK. It is going to be amazing, though, Dars. I love the pageantry of the AFL Grand Final. The whole build-up on the day really adds to it and one of the big moments is the national anthem them. And this year, the honour of singing it goes to such a worthy Australian. Well, prior to my accident, I actually felt invincible. I felt like everything leading up to my injury was, was falling into place and everything that I wanted to achieve, I was achieving. And, and then all of a sudden, I hit this brick wall. Tim McCallum's destiny was changed after a surfing accident left him a quadriplegic. Now, I never wanted to be a champion walker. I wanted to be a champion singer. So when the doctors and nurses told me that I would never walk again, my first question was, would I still be able to sing? He was just 18 years old, but with singing his absolute priority, Tim was determined that his voice would be his lifeline. But then he was hit with another massive blow. Well, because of the high level of my injury, which is C4 quadriplegia, uh, I have now uh, limited uh, respiratory ability because of the muscles that are affected due to my paralysis. So my breathing was affected, my ability to sustain notes and breathe in lots of air and exhale lots of air was, was limited. Um, so I had to adapt and learn a new singing technique. And when I thought about that more, I thought, well, how can I help in that area? Because I've been vocally healthy and respiratory healthy for so many years. And I think it had a lot to do with my music and my singing. So I thought, well, why not help people learn how to sing and in turn improve their respiratory abilities? So Tim paired up with the Hopkins Centre at Griffith University. Together, they created the program Singing Chords, a choir for fellow quadriplegics. The results so far have just been wonderful and people are loving singing, they're, they're loving getting together as, as groups and sharing music. But the most important thing is, is that they're actually really remaining healthy both physically and emotionally because singing just brings out these incredible endorphins. <laughs> This is a great purpose of why this may have happened to me. Australians all let us rejoice. Next week, Tim will achieve another big goal, scoring one of Australia's biggest gigs. It's been a dream of mine for I don't know how long to be able to sing at the AFL Grand Final. That one minute before the ball is bounced, 
before the siren goes for the start of the grand final, I get the opportunity to sing our national anthem in front of millions watching. And I want to do a version that just lifts people up and that just sets the tone for the day. So what I hope to get out of that moment is a song and a version of the anthem that people are really proud of and feel inspired by. And if there just happens to be one or two people out there in the community that see me in a wheelchair singing that and feel like they are represented in that anthem, um, that, will be, that will be the absolute added bonus. Yeah, with live concerts and the music scene being forced to shut down this year, it's fantastic to see performers like Tim being able to entertain live crowds again, Jo. Oh, I cannot wait to go and see a live performance of pretty much anything. <laughs> and while Tim's putting his best face forward, all is not lost for those of you who might be going to the game and want to dress up a bit, get out of the sportswear, slap on some makeup and make a day of it, I reckon. Here's Jade Kay with her tip on adding an extra layer of glam, whether you're going to the footy or not. Over the course of my career, I've encountered so many clients that have really struggled with applying lashes. I think with the glue, with how to apply it, where to apply it. Thankfully, we've come a long way with technology. Glam Express Adhesive Eyeliner and Lash Kit have hidden the glue component and it's now in the form of an amazing adhesive eyeliner. I really love a lash because it elevates any makeup look. It lifts the eye, it shapes the eye, elongates the eye. So Glam Express have left no pages unturned. They've got the beautiful black adhesive liner, which works really well for people like me who love to line their eyes, embrace the cat eye. But if you're someone that you just don't tend to use a black or heavier liner, they've given everyone the option to have a beautiful clear liner that works also. So I'm going to go for the black adhesive liner matched with the natural lash. Most people's eye length varies, so I tell a lot of people to give them a little trim and it'll help mold your eye even better. What I love about this Glam Express liner in particular is the felt tip. It makes it really easy to apply. So when applying liner to the eye, it works really well when it's graduated from a thin line to a thicker line. And what I love about this liner, it has up to 30 uses. So now we have the liner on. Just hold the lash to the right angle that your eye is at and press down for a few seconds. And there you have it. It's as easy as lash line and go. Welcome back to the House of Wellness. Now, I have to say, Joe, over the years, had a few broken bones. Bit of an occupational hazard for my former job. Yes. Never what, a lot of fun. How much? How many? Well, bones? the worst one was probably breaking my leg in school footy, the tibia and fibula, oh. my leg facing the wrong way. That was oh, yeah, not yeah, yeah. ideal, but <laughs> you just sort of get cheekbone, thumb, foot, hand, arm. Wow. Just sort of get used to it in the end, but not a lot of fun. I don't recommend it. No. Well, How about I, you? I have never broken a Seriously? bone. Seriously? No. Well, you have to get off the couch to, <laughs> to break a bone. So it <laughs> has never happened to me. And I'm hoping that means I have good, strong bones. But I'm one of the lucky ones because around 1.2 million Aussies suffer from osteoporosis, thin and brittle bones that can easily fracture. And most of them don't even know it which is why it's earned the tag, Joe, the silent disease, because it doesn't show any symptoms. Early detection is vital, and this silent disease can have life-changing consequences. I led a very uh, active, independent lifestyle. I worked, I exercised about three times a week, I swam. I uh, was active in a band, I played the clarinet in a community band. I did um, all the housework, all the cooking, at the age of 52, Elaine Cotter's life was turned upside down when she was diagnosed with osteoporosis. I was shocked. I really wasn't expecting it. Even when I thought this is bone pain, part of me still didn't want to believe that there's anything wrong with my bones at my age. 
After numerous visits to health professionals, scans and medications, it was no wonder Elaine's diagnosis of osteoporosis came as a massive blow. Her chronic back pain went undiagnosed for two years until quite by accident, she diagnosed herself. I have twin granddaughters and they were born last year. So one of them was only about six or seven kilos of weight and I was sitting just as I am here now, holding her with a bottle. I didn't move at all, but I felt a crack in my back. And that uh, led me to believe that this is not muscle. This is not mild arthritis. This is not a joint. I haven't moved. This is bone pain. And that's when I went back to my doctor and I said, I want to get a bone density check. Osteoporosis is very common and it affects about 1.3 million Australians. Probably the majority of those haven't been diagnosed yet. Professor Peter Ebeling is an endocrinologist and medical director of Osteoporosis Australia. He says even when people present in hospital with a broken bone, they're often not investigated for osteoporosis. So I did go to the doctor fairly quickly and uh, I was sent for x-rays and MRIs and investigations and then I was sent to a specialist pretty much within the first two months. A bone density scan measures calcium and other minerals in the bones, which indicates bone strength and thickness, which in Elaine's case were deteriorating and brittle. It showed that I had severe osteoporosis in my spine and osteoporosis in my hip as well, not as severe as my spine, but it confirmed that this is why I was in so much pain, because I had undiagnosed fractures. The most important symptom really is breaking a bone on minor trauma. It might be that I'm out in the garden and trip over something and then break my wrist when I use my arm to support myself when I fall. Or I could be older and fall over and break my hip. Or I could pick up my grandchild and break a bone in my back. That means you've got osteoporosis. We don't need a bone density test to make the diagnosis. Professor Ebling says having a diet of calcium rich foods as well as exercise is essential for bone health. But for many sufferers like Elaine, all is not lost. With the current options we have, we can actually reverse osteoporosis. Because if people have lost bone density, we can make the bone density go up. And with these newer treatments, we're getting closer to a cure for osteoporosis. Earlier this month, I had my second scan to compare to the first one, and it showed a 16% improvement in my bone density. I'm just now grateful that I know what's wrong with me, because those two years were a nightmare. I thought I was the one making up the pain, or having a really low pain threshold. My family, they supported me. But I came through it and that's the main thing. Many people see osteoporosis as an old person's disease, but stories like Elaine's highlight the importance of getting a bone density scan, especially if you have a family history. Uh, it's a familiar message, isn't it, Joe? Staying fit and active, keep up the vitamin D and the calcium, of course, all helps with your bones. Antioxidants are also one of the best bodyguards in protection against ageing and disease. And as we found out, you're never too young or old to start building up these vital natural defences. Cheers. <laughs> so ladies, I'm approaching the big 3-0 in a few years, which means I need to pick your brain on all things anti-aging. So I'd love to know if you change your skincare regime from your 30s to approaching your 40s. All of a sudden, I started noticing, oh, when I change my face, it doesn't like elasticate back. <laughs> it's just kind of stuck there. Um, so I have been paying more attention to just the fine lines. I'm not criticizing myself about them. It's a natural part of aging, but I would like to take more consideration into what products I'm using that can kind of, I guess, boost the plumpness in my yeah. skin. Collagen elastin, 
are the building blocks of the skin. Collagen gives our skin its firmness. Elastin supports the structure of the skin, so it keeps the skin tight. Um, in our 20s, our collagen starts to decline, so in our 20s and 30s is a great time to start thinking about introducing some anti-aging products into your regime. What about you, Nessie? I'm glad you are. <laughs> I just think you girls forget how old I am. Yeah. I, I, like, I will not look like this at 39, but I'd love you to put me on the table. I'm going to try. In a couple months. <laughs> but, um, yeah, Olive skin like, helps, especially. Olive skin helps, yeah, skin helps. Um, and if I could tell my younger self, like, what to do, it would actually be be proactive as opposed to reactive, which I've been. So when I noticed my first wrinkle, that's when I actually started to use eye cream for the first time. Yeah. I've actually got one for you. It's not a wives style, it's true. And it is Ooh. that grapes, <laughs> as we sit here enjoying this wine, mm. are actually very, very good for the skin. Did you know this? I had no idea. Really? No. Fruit stem cells is the innovative biotechnology of cultivating active plant stem cells. The Andalou Naturals Age Defined range contains grape and heirloom apple. Uh, the grape works to protect the skin against environmental stresses and the heirloom apple increases the vitality of the skin cells. A few ingredients that can help with anti-aging are resveterol, coenzyme Q10, goji glogopeptides, uh, bioactive berry complex, all super antioxidants that will help the skin. There's mm. definitely been a misconception that natural means it won't be effective. Totally. Which is, I guess, something we really need to educate people yeah. on. Natural products um, you know, loaded with, you know, vitamins and minerals and nutrients and antioxidants and anti-aging actives and fatty acids. So all these things really work to hydrate, restore, replenish, um, rejuvenate the skin cells. I'm always looking at the ingredients list and if I can't pronounce something on the in the ingredients list, I'm likely not going to buy the product. I think as we get older, we, we become wiser for one, um, <laughs> realise that just go back to basics and, you know, like Mother Nature is just giving us this gift and we're really just starting to discover it now as well. Yeah, without sounding too much like a hippie. <laughs> you already labelled me on. <laughs> it is, it's the power of plants. Mm. And we've got fruits, vegetables, oils at our disposal that uh, have, it's almost like honouring what where we've come from and yeah. when we can actually bring that into our bodies, just like when we're eating fruit and vegetables and it yeah. actually appears on the outside. It's the same when you put it on the outside yeah. of your skin. It smells like grapes. Yum. Ooh, it's very moisturising. I feel like that's going to do a fabulous job on any future wrinkles. <laughs>Back, Joe. For me, one of the most confusing aisles at the supermarket is the one with all the oils. There's sunflower, vegetable, canola, peanut, extra virgin, or plain. I think Heinz's favourite is the coconut oil. Yeah, he loves coconut oil. Is this true? Well, last week you were very confused by eggs, and this week it's oils. I really worry for you when you go to the supermarket, yeah, Dars. Right. Are you okay? <laughs> But whether you're looking to drizzle a splash of oil on your salad, fry up a chicken schnitty or roast a leg of lamb, Heinz is here with the good oil. Get it? The good oil. Look, I know it can be confusing walking into the supermarket and seeing the great wall of oils, but the thing is, not all oils are created equal. The thing with oils is that they've all been processed in some way or another to extract the oil in the first place. But the key is using a healthy oil that has gone through as minimal processes as possible, meaning it retains its nutrient density. Take extra virgin olive oil for example. It's produced within 24 to 72 hours of harvesting and it's extracted either mechanically or by hand with no heat or chemical processes at all. Now I want you to compare this with commonly used vegetable oils such as sunflower oil, canola oil and rice bran oil. These oils are produced through high heat and chemical extraction, meaning from the get-go they're damaged and highly oxidised. Sometimes these oils are even bleached to make them appear healthier and lighter in colour. You see, it all comes down to one word, inflammation. The omega-3 to 6 ratio in vegetable oils is out of balance. 
What does that mean? Well, when you have a food that's too high in omega-6, it's pro-inflammatory. What you want to do is celebrate oils like macadamia, avocado or extra virgin olive oil, which have a much better balance between those omega-3 to 6 fatty acids. That means you're going to be avoiding potential inflammatory or autoimmune diseases. Now you may have heard that coconut oil is high in saturated fat, but the good news is, is that the fats in coconut oil are fantastic for you. The latest science has shown that the fat in coconut oil is a readily used source of energy for our bodies, for cognitive function, hormonal balance and mood regulation. The smoke point basically means the temperature at which an oil begins to burn or smoke. And it's from a chemical perspective that we look at that smoking as the nutrients being burned off and destroyed when they reach temperatures they simply can't handle. So guys, my pick for really high temperature roasting, frying and barbecuing is definitely the extra virgin coconut oil and the cold pressed macadamia oil. Now when we step down a level to that more moderate everyday style cooking, avocado oil and extra virgin olive oil are the fantastic options. And don't forget, all of my favourite healthy oils are perfect for drizzling and using in dressings to retain maximum nutrient density and all that good flavour. Well, for me, olive oil has to be the best flavour, I think, Joe. How about you? Do you mix up the oils with different meals or do you stick with just the one? I just stick with olive oil because I'm not a very good cook. So <laughs> I, just, I just keep it basic. The trusty old olive oil works for me. Well, the Mediterranean diet is considered by many to be one of the healthiest ways to eat and extra virgin olive oil is on the list, which is probably good enough for me, Joe. Well, that's all we have time for today. Have a look at the website, houseofwellness.com.au for more information on the show or any of our episodes. And make sure you tune into the podcast, The Best of You, with Emma Murray and our own Joe Stanley. What's going on there, Joe? Yes, well, if you're interested in mindfulness, it's a really great way of demystifying what it is and learning how to practice it in your day. It's wonderful. Best of You in the House of Wellness, available at podcastoneaustralia.com.au. Strongly recommend you check that out. To get a mindfulness practice will be a great asset to you for the rest of your life. You can also catch up with Joe and GQ, Gerald Quigley, every Sunday on the House of Wellness radio show. Thanks, as always, to our very good friends at Chemist Warehouse. And until next time, stay well, and we'll see you back here on the House of Wellness. Love,